Good morning from our global headquarters in New York. I'm Manus Cranny alongside Danny Berger. You're welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set that agenda. A global bond route as markets question the Fed's path and fiscal risks. Simpler, more dynamic and agile, HSBC launches its biggest restructuring in a decade. And as global conflicts rise, defense company Saab order book surge. CEO Mikhail Johansson joins us later this hour. Good morning, Manus. Danny, good morning. The line of the day goes to Kit Jukes at SockGen. There's blood on the bond floor. And that is the very representation that you see in here. Ten-year government bond yield spiked by 11 basis points in total yesterday in the U.S. What is the driving force here? Because this spooking of the U.S. bond market caused a pretty uh, significant global carnage. Is it that the Fed may need to pause? That's what Torsten Slock has said. He talks about the 10 tailwinds of the U.S. Ed Yardani, uh, Yardani excuse me, still uh, beating that. Sell bonds, buy gold. And then we've got the Fed speak. And we can debate that in just a moment. Either ways, the propulsion in the bond market is higher. People now talk about 45 as being very realistic, if not that 5%. Roll it over and have a look at the bond market because, uh, again, there's a potential headwind as we see higher rates. And you saw a little bit of slippage in the equity market yesterday. Although, irony of irony, NVIDIA managed to make a new record high. So again, it's about unpacking the, the these headwinds uh, that may build up for the equity market. There's NVIDIA down by half of 1%. Mur it's, you know, reminiscent. Murder on the dance floor, <laughs> blood on the bomb Were floor. Were you about to sing? You were I'm so close. I'm not singing. I was I so could close. I feel it. I could feel it, Manus. Okay, so again, this is about fiscal, it's about monetary policy, yep. it's about Manus singing. I think it's interesting to debate. If this was about the Trump trade yesterday, is this a teaser for what it may look like after the election? Mm -hmm. Should there be a red sweep? And does that mean it's bad for stocks? Small caps were hammered yesterday under a Trump trade that's supposed to be good for small caps. Well, if you take the the the, the playbook from 2016, there's 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 a, a very initial sort of uh, momentum in these markets in the bond markets. Yields are up 50 basis points so far into this election, yeah. as opposed to when Donald Trump exceeded to power, which was the momentum higher in yields. So to a certain extent, this bond market is beginning to front run and price in yeah. a Trump victory. Well, also back then, inflation was low and the Fed would have welcomed more inflation and Indeed. been okay with it. This time, it's a different Fed, Manus, which might feel the need to pause or, as Adam Posen of the Peterson Institute says, maybe even hike next year should there be Trump policies unleashed onto this market. Anyway, Indeed. it is a global bond market sell-off. You noted this, man. Let's just quickly whip through it. You showed us the 10-year yield. There you go, up 12 basis points over the past two days. Look at what BTPs did. Italy also seeing moves of 15 basis points. Yesterday, Germany was 10. Let's get over to Seamus Murphy, Managing Director at Carrigale Hill Capital, an independent research provider focusing on financial systems and select equities. Seamus, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Can I just get your take on yesterday's big move in yields? Yeah, I suppose really from, from our perspective, the movement in yields is really reflective of, uh, you know, excess fiscal policy that's been going on globally. Um, you know, so I suppose really to, for us, it's no real surprise. What's actually happening is this concept, we think what's happening is this concept of crowding out, whereby because we're running these large excess fiscal deficits, then the private sector just kind of, you know, cannot participate to the same extent. So, you know, you look at the UK running 150 billion, 200 billion deficit every year. You know, so therefore the private sector can't participate. So therefore we're not getting any loan growth. And so therefore it's actually perfectly normal that we would expect a steepening at the long end of the curve. Um, so we would say that the long end of the curve is going to go sharply upward sloping. And that really is going to happen with two events. One is you're going to get much weaker economies as we move forward. So what the market has to begin to understand is that the short end is going to fall progressively much quicker than the market thinks we think. So like, for example, euro rates could be, you know, have a one, one, one and a quarter handle at the end of 26, and the long end could be a two. And that's so, very different to what, what's so, currently being talked about. Seamus, you're taking the other side of this no landing trade from Torsten Slock, the 10 tailwinds, in other words, that the Fed may need to pause in November. And it was a very expensive insurance cut that we had in the first place. Yeah, I don't think the Fed pauses. I think, I think, we're, going to get, I think we're going to get progressively weaker and weaker economies as we move forward. Uh, I think the, you know, the data is already showing this. I mean, when you think about the US, you had like pre pre pandemic, we had loan growth in the US running at four to five percent. We now have loan growth in the US running at two. Um, we now have you know a you know a progressive slowdown in what we have an internal measure of velocity of money that's slowing. 
loan growth is slowing. It just means that we're in the in the midst of what is you know progressive slowdown in the private sector. The problem the problem for the markets will be, and you spoke about fiscal deficits earlier, as we get this slowdown, deficits are going to widen. Um, and you know, that's going to be, I mean, you mentioned the Italian spread. Um, we think actually one of the biggest problems in Europe in particular is going to be what's going to happen in France, because you know, we talk about a slowdown, every 1% lower nominal growth in France results in a, you know, close to 100 basis points wider deficit. French credit spreads now running around 70 basis points. Italian credit spreads at you know, 130. Progressively, we think actually France is going to go wider than Italy over the next kind of like six to nine months. And I don't think the market expects that at all. Yeah, it, it's so Seamus, it really just underscores the new periphery for this European bond market that you're more worried about France than Italy, for example. How does a European government, how do they cope? Same with the ECB, this idea that their deficits, that their bond market vigilantes who are willing to punish them, but also the need for spending, for capital to help revive a European economy that is flagging at the moment. Yeah, I suppose that's really, been the, that's really been the crux of the issue for Europe for the last couple of decades since the introduction of the euro in terms of we don't have this, you know, this fiscal union, we don't have this political union. So, you know, we've obviously had the punishment of the periphery from 2011 to 2014. France ultimately will have to be punished in some way. And because we obviously don't have a, you know, a currency, you know, each region doesn't have a currency, then the only way that this can reflect itself is through the wider credit spread. The problem for France basically is, you know, despite people want, not wanting to admit this, France, the French leverage position has basically increased significantly over the last kind of like, you know, let's call it the last decade. But the problem is that real GDP per capita and constant euros is, has unchanged in France. So, you know, we see it rising in the periphery in Portugal, in Ireland, um, Italy is basically being constant, but the French credit spread, you know, it's, it's, it, it cannot, France cannot grow out of this problem. So the only way the, the French deficit can be corrected is through some kind of fiscal discipline in a French economy that already spends 24% of GDP on social, on social protection. This has got to be an exceptionally difficult journey for France. Um, you know, if there's a, you know, it's, if there's a scintilla of doubt about what's going to happen in France in terms of the credit spread, I think, you know, you know, this is going to turn into a pretty seismic event over the next kind of like six to nine months. Given what you're talking about, the fiscal largesse on the European side, we've got Christine Lagarde sitting down today with Francine Lacroix a little bit later on. Um, how quickly does the narrative become that we get to 2% a little bit more quickly than the market anticipates at the moment? 100%, I think we get to 2% much, much quicker than people think much, much quicker than people think. We're getting the slowdown in the private sector. It's pretty obvious. I think your prior guest was talking about, you know, auto sales in Europe in particularly weak. This slowdown is happening. We're seeing it on the consumer side. We're seeing it on the luxury goods side. Um, you know, and again, but again, I think the key point here is it's primarily because of this crowding out effect where the government is too involved in the economy. And this is going to increase as economies slow. And that's going to be a big problem in terms of, you know, we have the highest private sector funding need in, in a generation. I mean, when we think just in historical context, likely, you know, we had China's surplus funding the West from 1990 to 2007. Then we had QE. But now who funds, who funds the government? So therefore, that's why real rates have to stay high. That's not conducive to a strong economy. We have an upward sloping yield curve to try to encourage buyers. And there, but therefore, we get a progressive slowdown and the short rates will move towards 1% in Europe over the next kind of like 18, 18 months, let's say end of 26. Well, let's hope that the, the, the vestiges of the European debt crisis don't come back to, to haunt us again in terms of buyer strikes and nerves. Seamus, thank you very much. Seamus Murphy uh, of Carrigal Capital. Uh, and don't miss that exclusive interview with the ECB president, Christine Lagarde. It is at 10 a.m. New York time, 3 p.m. in London with Francine Lacroix. And just 15 minutes before that, you can get your ECB fix. I'm going to be speaking with the governing council member from Austria, Robert Holtzman, and some other big central bank players at the Global Banking Global Regulatory Forum from Bloomberg. You can catch that panel live go 9.45 a.m. in New York. Plus... It's a busy day. It's also Capital Markets Day over at powerhouse private equity firm EQT. I'm going to be having a fireside chat with the chairman and co-founder Connie Janssen. This afternoon, live go on your terminal is also where you can catch that. Other stories uh, trending on your Bloomberg terminal. Uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken started his 11th attempt to the Middle East to try to reach a ceasefire since the attack on Israel more than a year ago. He will be, meet with both Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Defence Minister in what may be his last visit before the election. 
VP Kamala Harris criticized former President Trump for not answering a question about whether he would back increasing the minimum wage during his campaign stop to McDonald's in Pennsylvania. When the vice president has called for raising the minimum wage, she has not made clear what hourly rate she would back if elected. Meta platforms will start using facial recognition technology to crack down on scams that use pictures of celebrities to look more legitimate. The company said it will compare the images in the post with the images from a celebrity's Facebook or Instagram account. And if the match is confirmed and is a scam, it will be blocked. Coming up, it's a new era for HSBC. The bank kicks off major restructuring, including its first female CFO. And Swedish defense firm Saab posted a beat this morning. Don't miss our conversation with the defense firm's CEO, Mikkel Johansson. That is later this hour. Context Matters on Bloomberg. It is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Cranley alongside Danny Berger here in New York. So HSBC kicking off a massive restructuring. The new CEO proposed to cut costs, reduce complexity. Writing in a statement, this is what he said. The new structure will result in a simpler, more dynamic and agile organization. We can focus on executing against our strategic priorities, which remain unchanged. Russell Ward is tracking the story on HSBC. Russell, this is a heck of a shakeup. Four divisions and essentially splitting the bank from east to West. One could say this is almost a victory for the activist shareholder Ping An from a few years ago. Yeah, you could say that, Manus. Uh, yeah, definitely uh, big changes under new CEO George Al Hedari. Uh, let's start with the business lines first. So they're being rearranged into four lines. That's Hong Kong, uh, the UK, and then emerged a newly emerged uh, corporate and institutional banking uh, unit that is uh, following. Um, internal resistance over the years uh, to combine the investment banking and the commercial banking operations. Uh, and then the last one is uh, to create uh, an international wealth and premier banking unit, um, obviously reflecting the uh, growing importance of uh, wealth management for HSBC. And then you've got the uh, geographical changes on top of that, as you mentioned, uh, splitting uh, into uh, east and west. The east division um, is uh, Asia Pacific and the Middle East, and the west uh, is the non-ring-fenced uh, UK unit together with uh, uh, Europe and the Americas. So, as you mentioned, um, Al Hedari is really just trying to uh, create a simpler, uh, more dynamic, and agile, agile organization with these changes. Russell, how much of this is a reaction to idiosyncratic HSBC changes versus just a new world for banks where r rate cuts mean that costs are under pressure? Yeah, I mean, I think the bottom line for, for this is that he's trying to streamline the organization. Uh, there were a few details uh, in the statement, uh, but he the, the, was the language uh, used uh, of, of trying to avoid duplication, which, of course, uh, is often code for uh, job cuts down the line. We don't have any details on those, whether they are upper level, middle management or back office or, or all, of, all of that. But, um, you know, that's one aspect that has to be uh, has to be found out. Uh, investors are really wanting to know more details. Also, there was no um, estimate of the size or scale of, of estimated savings that, that could be uh, could eventuate from these uh, th these moves. So really, um, you know, a lot of details to come. That probably reflects uh, the rather muted uh, reaction on the stock uh, stock trading, uh, both uh, in Hong Kong and in London as well. Uh, and so, with the bank reporting earnings next week, that will give uh, George L. Hedary uh, the opportunity to uh, really put some meat on the bones and um, explain uh, to investors and analysts, uh, you know, what he's trying to achieve here. I think it's going to be interesting to hear what he's got to say about putting the commercial and the institutional together. What is it? One builds the business and the other one eats, eats the other person's lunch. Um, something Noel Quinn was against. Let's talk about the appointment of Pam Core. She is the new CFO. What do we know about her? Well, she's the first woman to be CFO in the bank's 159-year history, so that's a big milestone in itself. Uh, she joined HSBC in 2013. Uh, she has a background in accounting and auditing. She's currently the head of risk and compliance, um, and she beat internal and external uh, candidates uh, for the job. Um, CFO role, of course, is very, very important at HSBC. Obviously, it's the position that uh, George O'Hedery himself previously held, uh, and she really she's going to be tasked with uh, implementing these cost cuts. So she's going to have a job ahead of her uh, when she starts uh, in her new role in January. 
Russell, appreciate it. That is Bloomberg's Russell Ward. Now, sticking with banking, but moving over here, U.S. banks will now have to give customers access to their financial data, fueling more competition for financial products. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau said in a statement, quote, too many Americans are stuck in financial products with lousy rates and service. Today's action will give people more power to get better rates and service on bank accounts, credit cards, and more. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Stephen Ahrens. Stephen, for anyone who's lived anywhere but the U.S. knows that we are so far behind on banking and credit card products. So what are the details of this new rule? So it's actually quite simple. This new rule requires banks to make it possible for their clients to just take their own data, take it under their own hands and take it somewhere else. So the dominance of banks to just shepherd that data and keep it to their own, which gives them great power of the client relationship, that's set to at least diminish um, and make it easier for clients to, if they see a better offer somewhere else, take the client data and go to the competition. And therein lies the whole point, isn't it, Steve? Good morning to you, which is I can take my data, I can shop around, and I can begin to look at people like PayPal, Betternet, Venmo. I can begin to look at these fintechs as potential alternatives for some of my banking. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the point of, the, um, of this new regulation. The idea is to increase competition, drive down costs, and make it easier for clients to also decide what's the best product. That, of course, means the flip side of that is for banking, it means uh, it will cut into profit margins if this uh, new regulation actually achieves its goals and makes it easier for clients to choose a new bank. Um, it will probably drive down costs and cut into bank profitability. Steve, good to see you this morning. Steve Irons uh, uh, on the very latest developments here in the U.S. banking system. Coming up on the show cut into smaller pieces why one activist investor thinks Cheesecake Factory would thrive by breaking it up. Context matters on Bloomberg. It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Manish Cranley alongside Danny Berger in New York. Bloomberg Tech Conference, it's in full swing in London. The executive editor for Tech, Tom Giles, spoke to the SML CEO a little bit earlier. Let's take a listen. The focus of China is on mainstream semiconductor. Right. The demand for that uh, has boomed in 2021-22. As a reserve, the demand we had in China in 2021-22 has boomed as well. And 21-22 was the time, uh, if you recall, where the demand was extremely high and ASMR was struggling to deliver tools to everyone. Uh, therefore, we couldn't deliver a large part of the demand in China. Backlog in China grew. 2023, the rest of market softened. We got tools we could ship to China. Same in 2024. So the level of business we had with China in 23-24 was more of a reserve of the non-deliver capacity in 22-21 than anything else. And we have always explained that you know, our uh, quarter at 50% of the business in China, almost 50%, this was not normal. This was a peak resulting from, uh, from uh, basically a, a lack of delivery before. Right. The normal business in China is around 20-25%. Right. And that's the normal demand related to mainstream semiconductor. And I think we're going to go back to those numbers over time. The CEO of ASML speaking with Bloomberg's Tom Giles at the Bloomberg Tech London. Okay, let's get you some front page news this morning, 5.23 a.m. in New York. A look at what's making headlines around the world. First up on the Bloomberg, SAP shares rising the most since July. Cloud revenue soaring at Europe's biggest software company. Basically, it's transitioning away from locally run systems with the promise of AI tools and analytics. Cloud revenue specifically a 25% increase in the third quarter. Uh, they've also prospered even as Germany's economy has stalled. GDP forecasted to contract in Germany for a consecutive second year in 2024. Of course, SAP has a much wider customer base than just Germany. Indeed. Um, let's talk about Reuters. They're leading with uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, hosting Russia's biggest gathering of world leaders. Now, this is since the invasion of Ukraine. The Kremlin expects more than 30 countries to attend. It's seizing its opportunity to cast Putin and standing up to the West in attempting to reshape the global order. 
The meeting is the first since the BRICS agreed to extend their membership to six additional nations at last year's summit. That was in South Africa. Finally, the journal has this. An activist investor she is urging this. the cheesecake factory <laughs> to weigh a breakup of three small brands. Okay, Manis, I know you haven't been to a Costco. Have you been to a cheesecake factory? I have been to a cheesecake factory in New York, but I didn't see the Tex-Mex eggs. <laughs> I mean, this is actually part of the reason why we're holding ourselves together on this show, because Danny's going to take me to cheesecake <laughs> factory, and I'm going to have whatever Tex Max eggs are. Literally, you read this story and you looked at me and you go, when the world is it? It's not Tex Max eggs, it's a Tex Max egg roll, which is maybe even egg more. Roll. Which is maybe even more. The beauty of Cheesecake Factory Man is, is that they have these giant menus and you can literally get anything your heart could desire. If, if she could have only one restaurant in the world <laughs> that she would go to and eat, this is an observation of the day, it would be Cheesecake Factory. Because you could literally have something different every single day. You, can. you would never get bored of it. What about cheesecake? Unless they break it up and make the menu smaller. I would cheesecake? Be devastated. Cheesecake. I don't need cheesecake. Too unhealthy. From our global headquarters in New York, welcome to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger alongside Manis Cranny. Let's set your agenda. It's a global bond right as the markets question the Fed's path and fiscal risks. Simpler, more dynamic and agile, HSBC launches its biggest restructuring in a decade. And as global conflict rises, defense company Saab order book surge. The CEO Mikael Johansson joins us in just a moment. Danny, good morning. Bond rights of the world. What a day it was yesterday. Basically on no specific catalyst. Here's where we stand this morning. Yields still going higher globally after 10 year in the U.S. moved to 11, Germany 10, Italy 15 basis points higher. Was it the risks of a Fed not cutting? Is it the risks of fiscal expansion with a red sweep? Either way, still under pressure this morning. 10 year yield at 4.2 percent. Equities also had a bad day especially for small caps. They were slammed. The assumption is higher rates, less cuts, bad for small caps. Banks also hit hard yesterday. Losses across the board. Manis, you pointed this out, the irony of all ironies. NVIDIA still hits a record high yesterday. Dollar is stronger. You can see dollar versus the yen at 150 this morning. That Manus. dollar yen is lit up like a Christmas tree earlier. I mean, it's up 5% in the past month. The dollar, yeah. the musculature of the dollar is huge. I got to hand it to Kit Duke for the line of the day, which is in terms of these bond markets, it's blood on the bond floor, never mind murder on the dance floor from a few years ago. But this, look, there was an eruption yesterday. You and I, we sat at the desk and we looked at U.S. bonds up five basis points yesterday morning and just the rest of the world yep. imploded. It was so fascinating to see, and I think this goes back to what Mohamed el said a few weeks ago, that global bond markets and markets in general lack an anchor. Yep. They don't have it from the Fed. They don't have it from the data. They certainly don't have it from politics. So you get this narrative swing back and forth that continues to lead from this whipsaw. The question is, is did we go too far again in one direction yesterday? Well, look, an 11 basis point move it, it is quite significant. Then you look at papers from, from the likes of Torsten Slock over the weekend, yep. talking about 10 tailwinds for the United States. And again, this invokes the narrative, whether it's from Torsten or whether it is, as you said, from Adam Posen, which is a pause in November and maybe even, according to, uh, to Posen, you and I have spoken to him several times, is the possibility of having to reverse and hike into next year. And let us not forget, oil prices were also higher yesterday with a threat of geopolitics. Indeed. And geopolitics is part and parcel of the next story, really, because conflicts, they are raging. Uh, between Ukraine, Russia in the Middle East, and nations in Europe uh, and beyond. Still, they see the need to replenish the defense stocks. Those efforts are long term. That is according to the CEO of Saab, Mikkel uh, Johansson. He joins us now. The Swedish defense company posted uh, strong sales growth and cash flow in the last quarter. Michael, good morning to you. Uh, well done on the numbers. A uh, number of analysts have said you've triggered relief, large prepayments. 80% of your orders were from international sources. I want to get a, an idea. You say you're not overly reliant on one government. So where was the spread from? Where were your biggest orders from? Good morning. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Well, the contracts are mainly in the Western world and uh, European countries, of course, some of them are spending a lot on defense, especially the Eastern European countries like the Baltic states and Poland, but also other, other European countries, of course, and, and, and in the Western world, also the U.S. So 
I think uh, we're seeing a really attractive portfolio from our side that we have in the marketplace and a big demand on that, especially on the sensor side of things and on the advanced weapons side of things, the dynamics and the surveillance business areas. So it's been a great quarter in that sense. Michael, we've caught up a few times over the past year or so. How would you describe the spending and the fear that's coming along with that? The fear that you see from these different countries and their needs to prepare for the threat of an actual hot conflict? Well, I think it's long term. I think uh, even though we hopefully get an end uh, so Ukraine wins the war and uh, we uh, still need sort of come out of this peace dividend and replenish stockpiles and, and build capabilities and take a bigger responsibility as European countries for our own defense, not being that dependent on the U.S., even though the transatlantic link is important. And then we need to help Ukraine build sovereign capacity and capability as well. So I think the growth and the demand side will be for quite some time. You talk about a replenishing of defence stocks there, but are we entering a new materially uh, demand-driven growth cycle? Well, I think it's a mix, I think. We, um, honestly, I don't know what levels sort of stockpiles are at in different countries, and I shouldn't. I don't know whether our deliveries go straight into the stockpiles or they go um, being donated to Ukraine. I, I think sort of uh, hard material is going to be used and needed, and you need to have more security of supply and uh, deterrence levels than we've seen before. I mean, look at the 155 millimeter that we don't do. I mean, no contracts had been in place since the 90s when this surge started. But it's also a new capability movement and using new technologies, of course, using drones to achieve things we did with large platforms before. So the whole industry is embracing new technologies and investing heavily, of course, including us. In, in new capabilities. So it's a mix of things. It's capacity, it's new capabilities, all at the same time, and, uh, and growing while we're doing that in a controlled way. Michael, when former President Trump, now candidate Trump, was speaking to Bloomberg just last week, he said, our allies, allies have taken advantage of us more so than enemies. He's threatened to let Russia do, in his words, whatever the hell that they want because of the lack of spending from Europe. How much of what you're seeing is in preparation and getting Europe ready for a potential Trump 2.0? Well, my perspective is that uh, it's right that European countries and Europe have to take a bigger responsibility when it comes to capabilities and capacity and defense spending independently of the administration in the U.S. Then we need to work with the U.S. and have a great collaboration, of course, with industry and, and the government, independently who is the president. So that's the direction that is important that we move into that direction. And the commission in Brussels is trying, trying to do everything they can to incentivize collaboration, create scale, getting countries to spend more money on defence and in the European Defence Industrial Programme going forward so we can align requirements, create scale and do more together. And that's the direction we have to go. So, of course, we have to take a bigger responsibility and we are in a hurry to do that. Can we just flip to the other side of that coin, which is if there is a Harris victory and Harris in the White House? Um, given what you've just said, that is, does not sound as if it's a material risk to your business nor to the growth of your business? Neither, I think, is a material risk to our business. I mean, we will continue to invest heavily and grow in Europe and support Europe to create bigger capabilities. We will grow our business in the U.S., and I don't think there is any connection to our local business with 1,000 employees and what they do, uh, depending on sort of the outcome of the election. It's, it's just a, a sort of a sound direction of making sure that we have a big responsibility for our own capabilities and deterrence in Europe. And uh, I think both administrations would su su support that direction. It's good for the U.S., mm -hmm. it's good for the U uh, U U Europe as well. So uh, I'm all in on that, and I think that uh, will not be dependent on the election outcome. Michael, then what difference does it make if there are talks of an off-ramp in Ukraine, hopes for a ceasefire, what difference would that make to your business? As I said, I don't think, I, I have a difficulty seeing that the politicians in Europe would just sort of go back to a peace di dividend type of, of uh, perspective of things. I mean, uh, what we have now is an, an, 
unpredictable, aggressive neighbor to the east, and, and uh, that will be for a long time. So European countries have to be, build sort of the capabilities they need. Look at Poland and Eastern Shield, spending sort of 4.5% of GDP on defense, no compromises. They will protect themselves. So, and that's what we see. So even if we see a ceasefire and hopefully win to Ukraine, it will still need lots of demand to replenish stockpiles, new capabilities, and help Ukraine building sovereign capabilities. So I think the demand is long term. Understood. Michael, thank you for joining us. As you say, we're in an era of European countries taking more responsibility. Michael Johansson of Saab, thanks for your time this morning. Coming up, bearish bets on the dollar are evaporating as we approach the election. We're going to discuss with Skylar Montgomery Coning of Barclays in person in New York. That's coming up next. It's your Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger and Manis Cranny here in New York. So we are somehow officially two weeks away from the U.S. election. I have no idea how we got here, but speculative currency traders have been swinging from bullish to bearish on the dollar all year as the polls continue to show a razor-thin gap between the candidates. The betting markets, though, surging for Trump. And yesterday saw the biggest positive swing in sentiment in three years after a bunch of bearish bets against the greenback were reduced by about $8 billion. Joining us now is Skylar Montgomery Koning from Barclays, pleased to say in person here in New York. So you get bearish dollar bets evaporating. The euro weakens half a percent yesterday versus the dollar. The yen goes back through 150. How justified is this dollar strengthening we're seeing? I mean, I think it's absolutely justified. And I'll give you a couple of reasons for that. It's not only the U.S. election and the shift in odds that we've had in favor of Trump. It's the fact that the U.S. economy is growing above potential. And you can't say that about any of the DXY counterparts. And that above potential policy feeds into less dovishness from the Fed. And I think that was the number one driver we saw for the U.S. dollar over the last two years. It was pretty much a one-for-one -one correlation that you had Fed odds for dovishness come off and the dollar rally. And so I think that's the fundamental basis for this rally. And then over the last two weeks, you've had it extended beyond because of the election outcome shift in odds. So fundamentally, it's about U.S. exceptionalism. But you look at the demonization of the euro with, with the data, which justifies it. Then you look at the peso down three percent if we go to a trump victory uh, maybe even a, a red sweep how much more aggressive can this dollar rally in the near term be then Absolutely, you can get more aggressive with the dollar rally. Quite a lot of Trump's policies are dollar supportive. So you think about fiscal, that's yeah. pro-growth, it's pro-inflation, that means you need a more hawkish Fed, that's pro-dollar. If you think about tariffs, because of the import substitution effect, again, it's higher dollar. And so for us, when we're thinking about a Trump victory, we've done some modeling of what you could potentially see, and on euro dollar, you could see as low as 103 or even lower, I think. With emerging market currencies, because Manus mentioned that the peso sank by some 3%, you have a Fed starting a cutting cycle, which is obviously supportive for EM. How do you weigh that up against potential tariffs and those types of risks for EM? Absolutely. So, I mean, tariffs, it's not only the impact you get through import substitution for the dollar, but it's also confidence effects, right? So when you have tariffs, they shake global growth, they shake global trade, and dollar strength in itself also feeds into that loop. And so it's quite negative for EMs, especially those that are directly targeted. I think that's more negative for EMs than any potential feed through you get from the Fed, although it is supportive for EM growth because they're allowed to ease because the Fed is easing. Look, part of yesterday's disruption, unanchoring, whatever, whatever phrase you want to use, what was the bond market, very much across the curve, right the way across the curve. Um, as Kit Duke says, there was blood on the bond floor. Um, where do you stand in terms of the narrative that the Fed may pause? Because you look at the rhetoric from the Fed speakers yesterday, and it wasn't as much about pause, it was about recalibration. Where are you in that debate? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We've had this massive turnaround on the narrative in the U.S., yeah. right? We've gone from thinking about recessions and the unemployment rate rising to a very strong labor market. Um, I think, you know, they set out a path for gradual cuts for the end of the year. You need to see very strong data to have some kind of skip. But it's not an impossibility by December by any means. I think we just need to see how the data comes in. And my worry is because we have these idiosyncratic events in terms of hurricanes, in terms of strikes, that some of the data will be weaker in terms of non-farm yeah. payrolls, the one we get before the November MPS. We could see some weakness there. And I think the Fed looks through it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't get a cut. It means that you probably get 225s rather than, I mean, 50 is pretty off the table now. But 
um, rather than a skip. But we're going to be having a Fed decision in the fog of a U.S. election, in an election that could take days to figure out who is the victor. As we have confusing data, just the November decision itself for the Fed, what are we likely to hear out of them when you can't trust the data and you don't even know who probably is going to be in the White House? Yeah, well, this is really the struggle. There are so many cross currents right now. We have bang, 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 non-farm payrolls, election, Fed right after the other. And so I think for them, they're just wanting to stay on message from what they said last time. And I think the near-term path is actually relatively clear in terms of gradual cuts. The question over is 2025. Where do we land? And that's really been the driver for the dollar as well as for fixed income. And that's where everybody's skimming back in terms of, where in terms of what we can deliver from 200 down to 150 basis points now. Um, there is this concept that we de-risk. We de-risk into a contested election. Red we don't know what the outcome is going to be. In a de-risking scenario for markets, is that dollar positive? Yeah, I think it's dollar positive, and, and that's what we're seeing right now, right? If you're having to put your money somewhere, you'd rather put it in the dollar than anywhere else. And I also think, you know, part of it is where the odds move you. You get strong dollar upside on a Trump victory, but you just get a little bit of relief on a Harris victory gotcha. in terms of you only get a little bit of dollar downside in that scenario. And so the risk reward is in your favor to be in the dollar rather than not. The IMF pointed out they have their fall meetings in D.C. tomorrow today, actually. They pointed out that global debt, public debt, is going to forecast $100 trillion this year, rise further in the medium term. You saw a bit of that in yesterday's market, not full-on yeah. vigilantism, <clears throat> but a bit of it. Do you understand the market's ability and bond yield's ability to kind of bully governments into pulling back in deficits? Yeah, I mean, I think the U.S. is a little bit of a different case because it is the world's reserve currency. People are always willing to buy U.S. government debt, but certainly term premium is very compressed in the U.S. still. We've had kind of paying attention to term premium and, and fits and Bates. Um, we're in a bit of a different environment than, say, last year because we're in a cutting cycle. We're not in a hiking cycle. But certainly you could justify higher yields off the fact that you have a bigger deficit or even just returning to kind of a more normal term premium than you have historically. And we didn't even get to dollar yen, and it's on a, it's on a ripper. We'll, sa we'll save that for the next time. Uh, Scala, thank you so much for being with us this morning. That's Scala Montgomery Coney of Barclays. And don't miss Bloomberg's exclusive interview with the ECB president, Christine Lagarde. That is at 10 a.m. New York time, 3 p.m in London. And just before that, I'm going to be catching up with Robert Holtzman, the gentleman from the Australian, Austrian rather, Central Bank, some other big players too, in global banking at the Bloomberg Global Regulatory Forum. You can catch that at Live Go on your terminal, 9.45 a.m. New York time. Well, let's turn to politics now out on the campaign trail. Minimum wage is just the latest topic that the Vice President Harris held up uh, to take a jab at her Republican opponent. My opponent, Donald Trump, does not believe we should raise minimum wage. And I think everyone knows that the current federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. I absolutely believe we must raise minimum wage and that hardworking Americans, whether they're working at McDonald's or anywhere else, should have at least the ability to be able to take care of their family and take care of themselves in a way that allows them to actually um, be able to sustain their needs. Now, this comes just a day after the former President Trump stopped by McDonald's serving fries to voters in Pennsylvania, causing quite a stir. Michael Shepard is with us now from Washington. Michael, good to see you. Look, the whole emphasis here is about the blue wall. That's where Harris was spending her time. They want to make sure that they really go after. I mean, the swing voters are, what, 4 percent, 1.2 million voters. This is the critical target market for them in these closing days. Uh, that's right. And they're really trying to reach people where they are on the economy because Harris believes that that is a, a winning message increasingly for her. She has closed the gap on this issue with Donald Trump uh, ever since the summer. And while they're not qu polling quite evenly, her message about creating an opportunity economy is something that is starting to resonate with those voters. And they are looking for the handful of undecideds out there, including a number of Republicans who can't abide by voting for Trump, but haven't quite made their minds up yet to cast their ballots for Harris. And the whole question of the minimum wage came up because over the weekend, the publicity stunt from Trump appearing at the McDonald's, it gave Harris an opening to talk about the minimum wage. The president, former president was asked, uh, do you favor raising the minimum wage from 725 it's been since uh, 2009? And he said uh, nothing. He did not take the question, didn't really answer it. And so that gave her an opening to talk about this key issue to many voters who feel like they're struggling. 
Shep, into this final stretch, the campaign finance figures we've gotten for Harris is, is quite stunning. More than $1.1 billion in the third quarter. That's more than twice of what Trump and the Republicans took in. Just two weeks away, how useful is that type of money? Well, you know, look, money can't buy us love, as we know, but it can buy so much in terms of digital advertising, TV advertising, and uh, and radio advertising, and help to finance some of the get-out-the-vote efforts that will be important to making sure that they have the turnout that they need to defeat Trump. And the Republican side is looking to do the same thing. They are leaning on a lot of deep-pocketed donors like uh, Miriam Adelson and, of course, Elon Musk, the world's richest man, to help bankroll those efforts on the Trump campaign side. Uh, and, in fact, what was interesting in the Trump numbers that came out over the weekend is that he is leaning much more on those super wealthy billionaire-type donors to write big checks than he has in the past. We all know that Donald Trump has, one of his superpowers really as a politician, has been able to raise money from small dollar donors, people writing those little checks, uh, clicking on his website, responding to those pleas, uh, you know, people who attend his rallies and support him financially that way. This time around, it's the reverse. He raised more than $500 million from people who gave a million dollars or more, uh, whereas uh, much less, uh, roughly half that, from the small dollar donors, people who gave $200 or less. And that was kind of the reverse for Harris. She got a lot of money from large donors, but she also got quite a bit in terms of small dollar contributions mm. from individual contributors. Yeah, and it's not even just that it's a big name in Elon Musk. He's willing to go on the stump for Trump, too. Hey, Shep, we appreciate your time this morning. As always, Michael Shepard in Washington, D.C. Coming up, we're going to set you up for your trading day earnings, exclusive central bank interviews, all of that to come throughout your day. Mr. Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger and Manis Cranny in New York. Let's get you set up for your trading day on this Tuesday. GM, GE, Kimberly Clark, Lockheed Martin, they all report results before the opening bell. BOE Governor Andrew Bailey, he will be speaking at 9.25 a.m. at a Bloomberg event. And don't miss our exclusive interview with ECB President Christine Lagarde Manis. That will be at 10 a.m. Yep, let's see what she intimates in terms of trajectory for rates. We just had uh, Skylar uh, with us talking about euro dollar down at 103. Three is her target, but there is uh, to quote Kit Jukes, it is the line of the past are blood on the bond floor. And we're not talking about murder on the dance floor, but we are talking about the eruption. I would say the burrs were erupted in the US and the vigilantes were sparked in Europe. I think there is a difference. Mm. I think there is a difference between the two. But it all could come down to this idea of fiscal spending, deficits increasing. Yes. So you do get the vigilantes more coming out in Europe, more coming out in places like Italy. And then you also had FedSpeak to contend with too. And the FedSpeak is interesting because Kashkari makes the point that bond rates are still actually, you know, having, having as he said, uh, pressure on this economy. It's still putting our feet on the brakes of this economy. Yeah, elsewhere, bonds continue to chart higher. We'll track it all for you. Surveillance, that's up ahead.